Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Hong Kong Data Forum, which has been renamed from Open Data Conference that took place between 2018 and 2021. Thank you very much to the Open Source Conference for hosting our kickoff event at the 11th conference today. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our supporting organizations, as shown on the slide here, for their invaluable support to the Hong Kong Data Forum. This year, our theme is Make Our Data, Make Your Data Make an Impact, Value Co-Creation for Hong Kong's Economic Recovery. In addition to the panel discussion today, five more panel discussions will be organized in the coming months. Today, we have an exciting lineup of panelists. Each of our three panelists will deliver a thematic talk later on. This will be followed by the panel discussion. The topic is helping residents in subdivided units by using data from multiple sources. We are honored to have invited Professor KK Link, SBS, Director of Jockey Club Design Institute for Social Innovation, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, to chair the panel discussion today. If you are joining us on Zoom, please feel free to submit your questions to send question here anytime during the presentations. During the Q&A session later, we will first answer questions from our audience on site before we address selective questions from online participants. Without further ado, our first speaker today is Professor John Bacon Sean, Head of Quality Analytics, Hong Kong Youth School of Professional and Continuing Education. Professor Bacon Sean is an applied statistician. Prior to his current role, he was the Dean of Faculty of Social Sciences and Director of Social Sciences Research Center in the University of Hong Kong. Including three years on secondment to the Hong Kong government assisting with the drafting of the Chief Executive's annual policy address, writing speeches and policy documents on healthcare, migration, population growth, opinion polls, education, and technology. Professor Bacon Sean's research interest include statistical computing, survey methodology, compositional data, biostatistics, gambling, data archiving, privacy, and policy research. Let's welcome Professor Bacon Sean, who will share his ideas on helping the underprivileged with census and statistical data. Professor, please. Thank you very much indeed. It's my great pleasure to be here today uh, and talk to you a little bit about uh, using census and statistics data. So, oh, got to click on the... Maybe is it resume slideshow or something? Great, thank you very much. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about some of the data that we can use. So first of all, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the census data. So in Hong Kong, we have a full census every 10 years, but we have a bi-census in the other five years. So the latest census data set is from 2021. Now, if you go to the Census and Statistics website, there are many tables from the census data that are freely and openly available without any charge. They also have a website that allows you to generate some tables. But the crucial element I want to talk about today is that academics are also allowed to do a detailed analysis 
of the 10% sample of the census data. So when they do the census, I don't know if you remember whether you were asked to do a short form or a long form. The short form is what 90% of the population is asked to answer, which is frankly very little information. The interesting information is from the 10% sample. So that means there are about over 700,000 people, respondents in that data set, over 270,000 households. And using the secure enclave in the census offices, you can do this detailed analysis. Census staff will then check that your tables are accurate and that you're not breaching privacy. So this very large representative sample allows examination of small subpopulations based on either household or individual characteristics. So that enables us to do some very interesting research. It also includes geocoding. So later on, we're going to hear a bit more about geocoded data. But the census data itself is geocoded. It's geocoded in several ways. But the way I want to talk about is the district council constituency areas. So this is extremely useful because there are over 450 of these areas. So each of them contains about 600 households sampled and about 1,600 people sampled. So this is quite detailed and enables very detailed spatial analysis as well. Now, in the context of uh, subdivided flats, the census data includes the household reference number within living quarters. So if there's more than one household in a living quarter, then we know how many there are. So that means we can identify where subdivision has taken place. So I must confess, I have not yet done the analysis of the subdivided households. There is a census report on subdivided households, but from my perspective, that's not very interesting because it doesn't compare the subdivided households to the non-subdivided ones, right? So the interesting question, for example, is amongst low-income people, why would some of them end up in subdivided rather than non-subdivided? So those are all questions we could answer, but I haven't answered yet. Okay. The other important source of data I want to talk about is the thematic household survey data. So this is in a regular series that Census does. This is very interesting and important because they have all of these interesting special topics. So that includes persons with disabilities and chronic diseases. That includes whether people want to take up jobs if they're currently economically inactive. So that's important if we want to try and get people to start looking for a job again. It also includes use of language, which is the detailed analysis that I used myself in my reports. And it also includes things such as training needs for people who are economically active. So this is again a relatively large sample. The, the thematic household survey has about 10,000 living quarters. And again, it records households within living quarters but it does have some weaknesses. For example, they do not record whether there's a domestic helper in the, house, in the household, which I find a rather strange decision. And it also does not cover households with no Chinese speaking member. That's because they contract out the field work. So that to me is again an unfortunate weakness but as long as you recognize the weakness, then we can still make good use of this data set as well. And again, academics are allowed to reanalyze this, these data sets, which can lead to some very interesting policy questions that we can answer using this data. So what sorts of analysis is possible? As I mentioned, with a very large sample that is representative, that means we can look at very small subgroups. So for example, we could look at one district alone, or we could look at a specific disadvantaged group, whether that's living in subdivided housing, whether it's recent arrivals from the mainland, ethnic minorities, minority language speakers. So all of these groups 
a relatively small proportion, but with such a big sample, we can still look at these in a meaningful way. So all of these subgroups are very hard to study well in Hong Kong because they're hard to get hold of. The alternative is that we can build very complex models. And I have also done this, and I'll say something about this in a minute, the sorts of complex models we can build. And again, the geocoding means we can examine the differences across these different district council constituency areas. So it enables us to understand at very fine detail differences even within a district council. Because there are about 20 constituency areas in each district council, so we can look at these things in detail. So I have some examples here. This is based on my uh, public policy research, research. That means my report is openly available. My data set is openly available for the data I collected myself rather than using government data. In this report, we're focused on language. So we're interested in the contribution of minority languages and dialects. So if we think about non-English Chinese, that means we have Japanese, we have Korean, we have Nepali, we have Urdu, we have Sinhalese, all of these. But also within Chinese, we have Chinese dialects. So we have the Hakka speakers in Northern District, we have the Fukien speakers in Eastern District. So we can look at all of these elements, and amongst other things, we looked at what predicts employment and personal income amongst those who are employed. So for example, how important are languages spoken and read and education? How important is age, marital status, and gender? Now, we, I make a distinction between those two groups of factors because we cannot change age, marital status, and gender by government policy. Or at least I hope we're not going to try to, but languages spoken and read, particularly English and Chinese and Portunwa, and education are clearly things where government policy can change. So it's very important to understand how the things we can change influence the outcomes after taking account of the things that we cannot change, right? So in fact, I'm not going to tell you the findings because it would take me half an hour just to do that. But if you're interested, this explains how important oral and written languages are and how important education is, both in terms of whether people have a job and if they have a job, how much they earn. We also examine the spatial patterns of language. So I'm going to show you a few examples. Now, these examples are about language. Maybe you're not interested in language. But in just the same way as I created these maps, we could similarly create a map showing the proportion of subdivided flats or the proportion of households with low income, right? where we could even control for household size. So we could look at different measures of deprivation depending on what's of interest to you, what's your policy interest, and we could look at it to understand the patterns. So I'm going to show you how this works for language, but it could be applied for other things as well. Now, this is the least interesting map. Why? Because this is showing you what's happening at district level. So, and it's also the least interesting because it's looking at how many people speak or can understand Cantonese. So obviously, most people in Hong Kong, in most districts, can understand Cantonese. You may be able to see that um, Western District and Central District are slightly lighter color. So there are fewer Cantonese speakers in that, those districts compared to the others. But otherwise, there's not much variation. So it's not a very interesting variable, and the spatial level is not very interesting. So what I'm going to do now is look at two specific districts, which from a language perspective, and actually also from an economic perspective, are very interesting. So those two districts we're going to look at are Sham Shui Po and Yao Chin Mong. 
These are the two most diverse districts in terms of economic and language outcomes. So, for example, this is showing you the number of people who can understand Punjabi in each of the constituencies in Shamshri Po. So you can see this constituency here, which is Lychee Cox South. Nearly 2% of the people in this district area, this constituency area, can understand Punjabi. Okay? 2% is not very high, I understand, but it's the highest in the whole of Hong Kong. So if you want to find Punjabi speakers, this is your best location. Previously, nobody had ever done the analysis that showed this particular finding. So there's lots of interesting questions that we can go back and look at to try and understand you know, where a particular thing is spatially interesting. This is showing you also Shamshi Po, but this is Vietnamese. So you can see it's a completely different place which has the highest level of Vietnamese speakers in the whole of Hong Kong. Right, so we have both the most, the highest level of Punjabi and the highest level of Vietnamese, both within this district, but in different constituencies. Okay? Now if we look at Yao Chin Mong. So Yao Chin Mong is also very interesting. So Yao Chin Mong has the highest proportion of Nepali speakers in Jordan North. It is over 30%. Right? That's amazing. That over 30% of the people in that constituency speak Nepali. But we also have other very different groups. We also have the highest proportion of Hindi speakers. So if we come to Chimsai Choi Central, we find the highest proportion of Hindi speakers in the whole of Hong Kong. Right? I could give you many other examples, but I think that's enough to explain what's going on. But as I said, this means we could similarly look at any other measure that we can calculate from the census data. So we could show where's the highest proportion of subdivided flats. We could show where's the lowest income group. We could show where's the families with the most children. Right? Depending on what's of interest to you, all of this is available. Now, you can't immediately get this. If I could immediately do the analysis for subdivided flats, I would have done it for today. But that means I have to book time to go and visit census. I have to pay them some money. They have to check my results. So you have to be patient, right? So maybe it takes you a month to do it, and you have to have a small sum of money. It's usually just a few thousand dollars. But it's all doable, and I think there are many things that we could look at, OK? I'm happy to answer any questions later on when we get to the Q&A. Okay, thank you.